Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It was around 10 years ago when I had an encounter that has stayed with me ever since. Our family has always been fond of camping in the majestic mountains of Alberta. And on this particular trip, we decided to take our trusty old motorhome and set up camp in a remote area near David Thompson. It was the kind of place so secluded that we were the only ones there at the time. Surrounded by the beauty and tranquility of nature, just beyond our campsite, there were numerous bike trails, rolling hills, and vast stretches of forest. Those hills, I would describe them as mini mountains, were quite challenging to climb and surprisingly large in size. My brother, being at that age when relaxation took precedence over exploration, prefer to stay back at the campsite. This left me with the freedom to venture out on my own, biking and hiking to my heart's content. On one occasion, I decided to grab my Walkman and hop on my bike to explore what I dubbed the mini mountains. It took me about 20 minutes to reach a point quite far from our campsite. As I pedaled along, lost in the music blaring through my headphones, Little did I know that an unsettling moment was about to unfold, one that still haunts me in my nightmares. I was jamming to some music when suddenly an eerie sensation washed over me, a distinct feeling of being watched. Startled, I brought my bike to a halt and glanced to my right. At first, all I saw was a large tree stump, but then, out of nowhere, a head peeked out from behind that stump. Time seemed to come to a standstill as I found myself locked in a stare down with this mysterious figure. It kept shifting its gaze from side to side as if contemplating its next move. I was frozen, unable to tear my eyes away from the sight. And then it happened. The figure stood up. The stump that had initially caught my attention turned out to be as tall as me when this enigmatic being rose to its feet. The sight of it sent shockwaves throughout my entire being. Something deep inside me screamed to run to escape from whatever this thing was. In my terrified state, I even lost my balance and tumbled off my bike, leaving a scar on my knee that serves as a constant reminder of that harrowing moment. The fear coursing through me was palpable, and my pounding heart seemed to drown out all other sounds. When I finally managed to make my way back to our campsite, tears streaming down my face, I couldn't help but pour out my emotions to my parents throughout the entire night. My dad, in his attempt to understand what I had experienced, asked me to take him back to the spot where it had occurred. But the mere thought of returning to that place filled me with such an overwhelming dread that I simply couldn't bring myself to do it. Even to this day, I refuse to camp in that general area. The memory of that encounter, etched deep within my psyche, has left an indelible mark on me forever altering my perception of the wilderness. It serves as a constant reminder of the unknown mysteries that lie hidden in the woods and the unexplained entities that may inhabit the very places we find solace in. On to the next one. I've spent thousands of hours camping, hiking, and otherwise spending time in the woods throughout my life. And I've experienced many strange, 
unexplainable and bizarre things while out there. I never expected to have an encounter like the one I'm about to tell you, though. It didn't even occur to me that something like what I saw could be real at all, let alone that it would be wandering around in the woods of northern Oklahoma in the middle of summertime. The year was 2016, and I was out on another one of my solo camping excursions. I go to them all year long, and if I had it my way and didn't make as much money as I do at the career job I've worked for the last 20 years, I would just park a camper vehicle and move myself directly into the middle of the wilderness and start living off the land. Well, at least I always thought that's what I would do, up until I had this particular experience. So, the plan was to spend a week at a local campground where I knew there wouldn't be too many people. Even if the place itself was mobbed and full of other campers and outdoor enthusiasts, I had been told about a spot that was way out of the way of where anyone else would be. That was off the beaten path, so to speak. My friend and some buddies had accidentally discovered the place one drunken night a few years earlier and had been going back ever since. Now, it wasn't exactly a place I could legally camp, but I've been approached by security and other personnel from other campgrounds when I would do this at other places in order to ensure that I was left alone, and once they knew I wasn't causing or looking for any trouble, they normally just told me to be careful and allowed me to go on my way. So, while I was headed to the campground, I wasn't planning on being around people. I have a high-stress job and am married with five kids. The amount of time I get to spend by myself is minimal. And so, when the opportunity arises that I can take time to myself and spend it outdoors doing what I love, I jump all over it. I also don't want to have to make small talk with strangers or listen to children whining the whole time. I know it sounds harsh, but like I said, I have five kids of my own, so when we leave them at home with my wife, I want it to be peaceful. I've seen some incredible things out in the woods, and once I swear I saw and heard a Bigfoot right near where I had chosen to camp that time. I don't bring my phone with me. It stays in the locked car, and I also don't bring work or weapons with me. The isolation is one of the most appealing things about it for me, and I wouldn't want all of the distractions anyways. I pulled into the campsite and paid to park my vehicle, then I made my way toward the direction where all the other camping areas were. I continued a sharp right-hand turn directly off the well-worn trail and directly into some pretty thick and treacherous underbrush. I made my way through it all as best as I could, and very slowly and finally, about 30 minutes later, I had found a decent spot to set up my camp. I was going to stay in that one spot for the entirety of my trip, unless someone came and told me I had to relocate. The only thing I noticed that was different about the area than anywhere else I'd ever snuck off to was the fact that there were signs posted telling people that the area was restricted and they should turn back now to avoid any danger. It was odd, because in all the years I had been doing this, and just that I'd been camping in general, I'd never seen those signs before. I was intrigued immediately because I was wondering what could possibly be so dangerous about that specific area besides maybe some predatory wildlife. I didn't think that's what it was, though, because normally, when that's the case, they put signs up that specifically state that it's so-and-so animal that's dangerous and in the area. Anyway, it just had me thinking is all. But I wasn't worried about it in the least and, in fact, I thought maybe I would see another Sasquatch while I was there. One can only hope, am I right? 
By the time I got to the area and got my camp set up, it was just about full dark outside. It was really warm that night and expected to stay that way, maybe getting a little cooler throughout the night. I didn't build a fire because I didn't want to draw any attention to the area I was in, and plus, it would have been dangerous because of how close together everything was. I laid down some cardboard underneath my sleeping bag inside of my tent to even things out a little bit, and then grabbed my flashlight and crawled in for the night. I'm an avid reader and love to read nonfiction books about people having adventures or mysterious things happening in the wilderness. It's ironic, when I really stop and think about it, that that's what I was reading when all of this happened to me. Now, I had noticed that the area where I set up my camp was a bit quieter than normal, but it wasn't completely silent. It wasn't eerie or anything. And again, I thought that maybe there were some predatory animals in the area that were scaring most of the other wildlife. I settled in and relaxed with my book. Within minutes, I started to hear really strange sound that was kind of like the hissing of a snake, but was mixed with a series of chirps, clicks, and even squeaks. I know people think that all reptiles are mostly mute, but that's not the case. And what I was hearing sounded like a mix between a snake and a lizard. That was unlikely, and it also just sounded like it was coming from something much bigger than any one of those two things could ever possibly be, at least in Oklahoma. I tried to ignore it, but it kept getting louder and louder, like it was slowly getting closer and closer to my tent. I was more annoyed than anything else and knew that if something else happened, I would have to hear my wife lecture me about why we aren't supposed to sneak off onto land we aren't supposed to be on and spend a week there all alone, blah, blah, blah. Just as the noise sounded like it was almost right outside of my tent, I also heard the trees and bushes rustling, as well as branches breaking. It sounded like someone or something very large was right near my tent. I took my flashlight and slowly exited my tent. I shone the flashlight everywhere, but I didn't see anything. I stood there for a moment, silently waiting to see if anything moved again. Sure enough, the tree directly above me started moving. There wasn't much wind, and even though it was blowing a little bit, there was one area of it where the branches looked like they were hanging down a lot lower than the others. It was weird, only because of where it seemed to be thinking, in that it was right in the middle, and I don't know how else to explain it except to say it looked wrong somehow. I stared up at it, and as soon as I shone my light on it, I thought I saw something move very quickly, like it was trying to avoid the light being on it. I didn't actually see anything move, but the tree branch that had been stooped just a second before, had snapped back up and were now in perfect alignment, in position with the rest of them. Something had definitely been on those branches, I was sure of it. I couldn't figure it out, though because, like I said, I had my light shining right in that spot and didn't see anything. Something heavy had been on those branches for them to have been stooped so low like they were and I was starting to get scared. Just then, as the beam from my flashlight shined over the rest of the tree, an owl hooted loudly and flew off into the woods immediately after that. I heard what sounded like claws coming down the tree. I got closer, figuring whatever it was must be too small for my light to catch, but big enough to have bent those bushes. I was extremely confused. All of a sudden, I once again heard nothing. It was only then that the entire forest seemed to be totally on mute. I didn't hear anything at all, except noises that sounded like rodents crawling on the ground a few feet in front of me. I shined the light there 
But again, I saw nothing. I thought I was losing my mind. The sounds were getting further and further away from me until the bushes started moving about 10 feet in front of me. I was getting agitated, and I thought that maybe somehow someone somewhere knew I was out there and had decided to come out and prank me or something. With all the reality television nowadays, I actually started to think that the park was up to no good and maybe filming a video or something. I only wish that's what it had ended up being. I shined the light where the bushes were moving, and that's when I saw a glimmer of something. It looked like a set of yellow eyes staring at me, but they didn't seem to be connected to anything, and they looked like they were just hanging there in the air, at least at first. I had to blink a few times, and when I opened my eyes again, whatever it was had gone. I was in no mood anymore and decided I needed to get some sleep. I crawled back into my tent, turned off my flashlight, and went to sleep. I planned on investigating more in the morning, but for that night, I was done. Or at least I thought that I was. I woke up at around two in the morning to use the bathroom and walked over to the tree line to do so. I had my flashlight shining onto the spot where I was doing my business, and as soon as I was done and started walking back to my tent, I heard the weird noise I had originally heard earlier that started this whole thing. I was in no mood, and I was tired. I pretended like I didn't hear it or the sound of what seemed to be a large rodent following me as I got back into my tent. My curiosity had gotten the better of me, though, and I made the mistake of peeking out of my tent flap to see if I could catch who or whatever it was red-handed. Do I wish I never did that and had just gone back to sleep? I saw it as it appeared literally out of nowhere and a little bit at a time, what looked like a reptilian humanoid. It almost phased in from feet to the tip of the head little by little. It was looking around, and in the light of the moon and stars was enough that I could see it very clearly. And I could see every last detail. The thing was bipedal, and it was extremely muscular. It looked almost sculpted. That's how fit it seemed to be. It was definitely a male, and it was looking all around. It flicked its forked tongue out a few times and blinked its bright yellow reptilian eyes a couple of times. It had very long arms, and I don't know how else to put it, except it was definitely an apex predator, and if a human being had that body, he would have been a world-class athlete. It looked like a walking lizard. I must have gasped audibly, because suddenly its head turned quickly, so it was facing my direction, and it locked eyes with me. Its mouth formed a smirk, and its head went somewhat down, like it was tilted, so that it was looking up at me at that point. I don't know if it was telepathic enough to be able to hear my thoughts, but I somehow knew that it was extremely pleased with and feasting off the terror that it was causing me to feel. I couldn't take my eyes off of it and just sat there staring at it for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, after about three or four minutes, it put its hand up and took a good long sniff of the air, licked its reptilian lips with a grotesque forked tongue, and then it got on all fours. It looked like a giant lizard. It was about eight feet tall, standing up, and looked even longer when it was on all fours. Then it started to crawl toward my tent. I watched in horror as, from head to toe, it slowly phased out of existence again, and while I knew with absolute certainty that it was still there, I couldn't see it anymore. It had cloaked itself and rendered itself invisible right before my very eyes. I was in complete and total panic, and was looking all around for signs of where it might have gone. 
Finally, I heard the leaves in the tree above me start roughly rustling around again, and when I peeked out and looked up, I saw the branches were bent down in the same unnatural way as before once again. It was up in that tree, and it was directly above my head, but I couldn't see it. I sat there, cowering in my tent and wide awake all night long. Right before sunrise, I heard the clicks and squeaks and hissing again, and heard the leaves above me moving around. Then, within seconds, I looked out of my tent and saw the bushes part up ahead of me right where it seemed to have come from in the first place. I didn't wait another moment. I jumped out of my tent, packed up my things as fast as I could, and hauled butt out of there. I couldn't get home fast enough. When I finally got home, I was exhausted and terrified. I had woods behind and all around my home, and now that I knew what was really lurking out there in the wild, I was completely paranoid. I walked into my house, babbling like a crazy person to my wife, who told me I needed to stop or I would scare the children. Later on that night, I explained to her what I had seen. After I showered, ate, and got into some rest, amazingly, she believed me right away and told me she has seen some things like that all over the internet and that it was happening more frequently than I would believe and that most people could even begin to imagine. I started my research the very next morning and I haven't stopped since. I never saw a creature like that again, and while I still like to go on solo excursions for long stretches of time in the great outdoors, I stick to the common and legal areas whenever I do so. I've also often wondered if those signs were about the creature. Did at least one person at the park know that the creature, and maybe more of its kind, were lurking out there at that time? I believe they most likely did, and that's why they put the signs up. They wouldn't want to lose any money by causing the panic and telling people that a reptile man was roaming the woods, feeding off people's terror that it was also the cause of. I don't know what else to say, except that it was the craziest and most terrifying thing I've ever encountered, or that's ever happened to me. That's really all there is to it. On to the next one. In Cumberland County in Tennessee, while home from college on holiday break, I was out visiting friends one night. I had pulled over and was outside the car in a remote area near my parents' home with a friend. While outside the car, some movement caught my eye on a rock cliff on the opposite side of the road and approximately a hundred feet away. I saw a figure approximately seven feet tall, broad from shoulders down through the torso with a large head covered entirely with dark hair, standing upright, arms straight down by its side. No eyes, mouth, ears noticeable. I stood still for 10 to 15 seconds, staring at the image. Then it turned to its left and disappeared no sounds made. I hurried my friend back into the car and asked him if he saw what I saw, and he said he only got a brief glimpse of a shadowy movement. Although I definitely saw, as described, I've dismissed this as being a person, maybe a hunter in the area, and I was looking upward at the time so the image could have been distorted but reading of other similar sightings since has prompted me to submit this occurrence. It was approximately 11 p.m., dry and still weather conditions, temperature in the 40s, sighted from roadside not far from Bird Creek Bridge on South Old Mill Road. It was standing on a cliff approximately 100 feet from where I was standing outside of the vehicle. It was on a rock cliff overlooking the road. I returned to the exact location the next day and looked around the spot on the cliff I saw the image, but found nothing unusual. One friend was present, but did not get a good visual. On to the next one. 
in Gibson County, a nine-year-old girl and her older brother would take the trash out to the edge of the woods where they would burn it in an old oil drum. They had ridden their three-wheeler, called a scat tracker, down the hill to the burn site and started to burn the garbage. They were watching the garbage burn and she heard a low growling noise and turned her head toward the right where it was coming from and saw something in the shape of a man that was black and hairy. It was walking into the edge of the woods just over a slight hill. She grabbed her brother and said, what was that? He did not know and decided that they should get on the three-wheeler and get back to the house as fast as possible. On to the next one. In Williamson County in Tennessee, my brother and I were out riding our mini bikes one afternoon after school, approximately 4 to 5 p.m. It was the beginning of spring and we were searching for bait to go fishing. We parked our bike on the road, which at the time was gravel and traveled very little. We walked down a path that was used by farmers to get to his pasture, where he had cattle grazing. As we walked down the path, I felt as though we were being watched. It was an eerie feeling that still haunts me to this day as I recall the incident. Off to my left and approximately 30 to 40 yards away and 50 or so yards from the main road was a hairy creature standing in a bent over slump raking its arms through a patch of mayapple. My brother saw it at about the same time. At that moment, the two of us ran as fast as we could, not looking at each other, but looking at the creature over our shoulders. I was afraid that it would come after us, but it stood in the patch of mayapples looking at us as though it didn't know what to make of us. I have told this story many times since that day. Many people laugh in disbelief, but I know what I saw, and it could only be one of two things. Either someone dressed in a Bigfoot costume, or it was Bigfoot himself. Nothing was heard at all from the creature. There was no odor coming from the creature that I was aware of. Either my brother and I were engaged in laughter and jokes as we walked down the tractor path. There was a small stream that flowed approximately 30 or so yards from the creature. The area was heavily wooded with hard wood, and still to this day, there is a larger stream, Lick Creek, which was approximately 100 or so yards from the creature. At the time, there was a one-lane steel bridge that crossed Lick Creek. On to the next one. In Roan County in Tennessee, the closest water would have been probably Watt Bar Lake, and the nearest road may be Pump House Road near Highway 27. Sometime around midnight, my sister Alice heard dogs barking outside her window. After going to bed and turning out the light, she was terrorized by a heavy, deep, and powerful scream, like with all of its might. The sound was right outside her bedroom on the front porch. She was terrified and awoke her husband. They ran to their car and came to pick me up at my workplace at about midnight. We drove back to their house and turned the car in the direction of their house. The headlights hit the basement door. Standing there at the door, was a dark creature approximately six feet tall. It stood upright and it turned and looked at us. It was not human. It was dark and appeared to be hairy and seemed to almost have no neck. It was not a bear. Its eyes were large and shiny. We three saw this. Similar sightings have been reported in this county. Rockwood lies in a valley below the Roosevelt and Cumberland Mountains. It is surrounded by lakes. We notified the police, but no report was filed, and we have told friends. 
on to the next one. In Giles County, in Tennessee, a farmer watched a Bigfoot in a barn kill a calf by throwing it onto the ground. In Lincoln County, in Tennessee, in April, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall with red eyes was seen. It stank and also wheezed like an asthmatic horse as it climbed a bank and was seen by two teenagers in an automobile at night. On to the next one. In Flintville, in April, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall, with red eyes and stink as it wheezed like an asthmatic horse, tried to abduct Gary Robertson, aged four, as he played in his backyard that evening. Mrs. Jeannie Robertson heard him cry out and rushed to see a huge figure coming around the corner of the house. The creature was eight feet tall and covered in hair and reached out its long arms toward Gary and came within a few inches of him before she grabbed Gary and pulled him back. Mr. Robertson had run to the door when he realized something was not quite right and he saw a big black shape disappearing into the woods. The following day in Flintsville, a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall with red eyes, stank and wheezed like an asthmatic horse, was chased down and cornered by a posse led by Deputy Sheriff Homer Davis, Melvin Robertson, Gary's father, and Stan Moore of Fayetteville. After it had absorbed about 40 rounds of gunfire, the beast tossed a barrage of boulders at the men and managed to slip away into the woods. Traces of mucus, blood, and hair were found the next day, along with 16-inch footprints. The hair was analyzed and did not belong to any known animal, though it had a resemblance to human hair. Again, in Lincoln County in Tennessee, while there were sightings of a hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall, with red eyes and stink and wheezed like an asthmatic horse, a woman stated that her radio aerial had been grabbed by a Bigfoot that had jumped onto the roof of her car. On to the next one. In Obion County in Tennessee. Well, this is going to sound strange, but here goes. I grew up in a small community where something else lived. I have talked to people from that area from three generations that have seen this thing. If you have never seen it, most of the people that have won't tell you much. They do not want anybody to think they are crazy. I even knew one man who is dead now that had a relationship, fed it, and it was not afraid of him. Anyway, I've seen it three times during my childhood. One time from about 200 yards with two other people. The other two times I was alone. One of those times, I was maybe 40 yards away, coming home, and it was in my backyard by a fence, but the last time was very intense. I was walking home from town, about three miles away, and it was pretty dark, so I was looking down most of the time. I was about a quarter of a mile from home, and I turned onto the street that led to my house. I walked about 30 feet, and there it was. It was about 10 feet in front of me. It was down on its hands and feet doing something. It saw me at the same time I saw it. It stood up and we looked at each other for a few seconds. It seemed like forever. Then it ran one way and I ran the other way. Now, we always called it the white thing. It looked like what most people think a Bigfoot looks like, except it is an off-white color. It is about eight to nine feet tall. My father always said all of us kids were seeing things until he found tracks while hunting. I know 30 to 40 people who have seen this thing. The area is mostly farmland, now close to bottom land from the river. I've talked to people over three generations that have seen it. I know 30 to 40 people that saw it at different times. 
One time, about 20 kids saw it at the same time. I can tell you several stories that I have been told. On to the next one. Let's see. It was about six years ago. My family lived on our houseboat on the river in a small town in Mississippi. When we were on the deck one evening, looking across the river, the tide was low, and you could see well into the woods, maybe 25 feet from us. Something bent down near the water drinking. I got my binoculars and took a closer look. It was pinkish tan with bulging eyes, funny-looking ears, two arms and two legs, and what appeared to be horns coming out of its head. With a short, round body drinking from the shore, from what I saw, I would swear it was a troll. It was devil ugly. I took my phone and put it to the lens and took a picture. And to this day, anyone I show it to swears it's a river troll. Now, living on the houseboat, you see lots of creepy stuff in the swamp. Also, there would always be trees or logs laying across the ditches of our 1,000-foot driveway in the middle of the swamp, as if something put them there to cross the deep parts. Couldn't walk up or down without that eerie feeling of being watched. And it wasn't just me. Anyone who came out felt it. You would also hear what sounded like monkeys. One time, I saw something throw a rock and it hit my friend. I still own that property and the houseboat, but none of my grown kids will even go out there anymore. On to the next one. For years, our house has been haunted long before we moved in. An elderly couple and a deformed man all passed away here. And since there has been more death either in or connected to this home. We have often felt the presence of loved ones. However, as of this past year, we started hearing their voices. Obviously, we just assumed they had learned to speak to us finally at first. That was until one morning my mom told me she thought she heard me call to her and since she was sick with COVID, didn't want to get up. It was low, but she knows she heard me say, Mama, which is what I call her normally. She replied and said, What? with no response. I apparently continued to call to her, and when she would ask what I wanted, increasingly more irritated, no reply. Finally, the last time she got up, opened the door, only to see me fast asleep on the couch. It unnerved her but she and I both attributed it to the fever. However, a week later, I heard my mother call to me, and I don't get scared easily, but the super soft voice of my mother calling my name, so soft it could have been my imagination, I thought. It scared me to my core. I was terrified. I ignored it at first, because it sounded like it came from outside or below me in the basement, and I knew my mother was asleep in bed. I continued to make my food as I was in the kitchen, and I heard it again, and this time it was loud enough I knew it wasn't my imagination, and got even more afraid as it was in the very early hours of the morning and I was like 97% sure my mom was in bed asleep. And my mom calling my name doesn't ever scare me because we are pretty close and I love my mama. And I've never been afraid of her, but I was afraid. So much so, I ran to her room, waking her up in the process and asked her if she had called my name. She said no. Seeing that I was shaken up, she got up and talked to me for a minute, and then I searched the house and checked outside. We live in a large city in Kentucky. No big scary animals here. I found nothing. I should also tell you, our lives were pretty rough at the time, 
and everything that could go wrong pretty much was. We pretty much figured out it was a mimic demon. We went through and blessed our house and called upon the blood of Christ, passion to wash over and protect us and the house, going room to room with holy water. And while it didn't stop instantly, the stuff started to slow and then stop over the next week, and things started getting better, and now, to our knowledge, it's gone. On to the next one. Okay, I've always been a believer, and I'm going to tell something that I've disclosed to hardly anyone. I was 16 years old, camping out in a tent in the backyard with my brother and best friend and my dog, a shepherd Dobie mix. It was almost a full moon out, and we started hearing weird grunts and growls from the woods around us. My dog started acting scared, and she wasn't scared of anything. We told my father, and we all heard something large moving around. We armed ourselves, and I went about 500 feet or so down a wood path. I looked and saw a huge black shape standing on the path, about eight to nine feet tall. It smelled terrible, and I took a couple of steps away, so I dropped to my knee and fired two rounds at it from my Enfield. It vanished before my eyes. The next morning, we searched for signs. I hit nothing. I still live in the same place, but will not go into the woods unarmed. Every so often, I still feel there's something watching me and my home. On to the next one. So, this one time, I was 12 or 13 years old. I snuck out of my parents' house and headed through some woods I live nearby. It was a shortcut to the house party a few blocks away I wanted to get to. While going to the woods, I would hear literally every animal. Birds, crickets, the sounds of the woods, you know. And then out of nowhere, everything literally fell silent. And that, too, when I stopped. Because I was like, what is going on? It got real quiet. And all I hear is my heart rate spike up. And then I hear this big branch breaking in the trees, break off and tumble down. Then I look and just see these big red eyes and this ear splitting scream and it uncurled these massive wings, huge, and I mean huge wings, and it started screaming and chasing me all the way back home. Luckily, I left my window open and I jumped right in my bedroom, slammed my window, and locked it. But I kept hearing it tap, 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 and scream all night long. I cried myself to sleep that night and never again snuck out. I believe I was attacked by the Mothman. On to the next one. I'm camping out in Northern California by myself with my wolf dog. It's the middle of the night, and I'm suddenly awoken by my wolf, growling and kind of freaking out inside my large Coleman tent with me. All of a sudden, I hear these huge bipedal footsteps. They are literally shaking the ground on which my dog, my air mattress, and I lay. It walks up to my tent with these huge steps, reminiscent of Jurassic Park, but not quite as severe, a shock wave from each step. In between each step, it had a nasal whistle, making it even more menacing sounding. Me, at a loss of what to do besides grab my axe and pray to Odin that it was not my end. I muster up some courage and said, Hello? It huffed this large exhale as to say I'm not worth its time, and left one large step, followed by a nasal whistle, by a large loud felt step. After about five minutes of waiting, I sprung from the tent with axe in hand and wolf by my side. We saw no track, 
We saw no sign, but we felt watched for the next two nights there. The wolf and I, that is. On to the next one. It was about four or five years ago. Me and a few buddies liked to go and visit abandoned houses and buildings from New York to Texas. We went into the pine forest in New Jersey, not knowing a lick about the devil that lived among the pines. We found a two-story house that my buddy Matt suggested because he saw it when we were just driving through, and he was the driver, so how could I argue with him? Well, we went into the house and there were dead animals and bones everywhere. I didn't pay much attention to it, so I kept going through the lower floor when Matt suddenly started yelling my name and panicking. I ran upstairs to where he was, and in the room without a door, I flashed my flashlight into the room as Matt ran off. In the room, about ten feet away from me, stood the legend himself. His head looked like a bull's head that had been abused pretty badly. The lower torso had a tail and legs to match the head, equally in bad shape. The wings looked much like a bat or a scaleless dragon's wings, if you must. The upper torso looked like a grown man's chest that hadn't had good hygiene for years. It did have claws with three fingers and a thumb. It stood there like it was observing me, like I was observing him for almost ten minutes or maybe more, up until he decided he didn't want me to be there anymore. He made a sound that I could only explain as a hyena with the deepest voice I've ever heard. My hair stood up and I froze because I remember that Matt ran out of the house, so it was just me and this beast. The Jersey Devil scream sounds like an alligator hiss, but, as I said, a little deeper of a tone. Once I heard that, I feared for my life. The feeling I had was like, if you imagine, you got on the slingshot at Six Flags and heard the rope holding the ride snap. The only difference is I couldn't scream. Well, I was screaming like a little girl on the inside. After he screamed at me, he took off out the window that was behind him. As soon as he left, I regained control of my body, peed myself, and took off out of the house like my life depended on it. I got in the truck with Matt and burned rubber on the way out. Me and Matt had never seen anything like that in our lives. On to the next one. For around 3,000 years, people have wondered if we are reincarnated after we die. Some people believe that birthmarks show the way in which a person died in a previous life, and those with no birthmarks died of natural causes, old age, or could be a brand new life starting out on a journey of many new lives after the one they are currently living. Many people have memories of a past life, knowing details of places they've never visited, or saying things about people they have never met. Others are able to give accurate information with no explanation other than having experienced these memories, but not in the body they now live. When my brother was four years old, and in kindergarten in Philly. He told his teacher about when he used to live in France. He was able to give her an address, and he talked about restaurants he liked in great detail. When my mom came to pick him up, the teacher spoke with her and said, I didn't know you lived abroad. My mom had never lived outside of Philly, so her reaction was basically, huh? The teacher filled her in about what my brother had told her. And that night, my mom asked him about it while the two of us were coloring. He once again gave the address and the restaurant details, and then he freaked my mom out when he concluded the sentence with, Well, back then, everybody used to call me Pierre. My parents looked into it back then, 
and the address that he gave her was a real place in a real town. None of us know what that address was. I'm now in my 50s, and my parents and brother have passed away. My older brother and sister still remember all of this as well as I do. On to the next one. My daughter was three or four years old, and she kept asking me, Mommy, do you remember when you were a little and I was big? I took good care of you. We went to the store all the time. Then, when her little brother was born, she asked me if she could call him Augie. I asked her where she had heard that name. She told me that she had made it up. My great-grandfather passed away on August 31st, 2001. She was born September 7th, 2011. My great-grandfather used to take me out to the store a few times a week. He had a dog long before I was born, named Augie, a nickname for August. On to the next one. When I was three years old, I used to tell my mom stories of being a little Chinese girl. I'm not Chinese. Apparently, I lived at the bottom of a hill with my grandmother, and I died in a flood. When I was around six or seven, I came home from school upset that I'd been surrounded by a group of boys, and I cried to my mom, saying it was like when the soldiers on horses came to take us away. On to the next one. My daughter, who is now a teenager, received two identical plush My First Doll toys as gifts when she was a toddler. We live in West Virginia, in an English-speaking household. She would say their names with a different kind of lilt or accent. The names my daughter called her dolls turned out to be Yiddish for doll and small plaything, but they sounded like Yedel and Lilk, a friend of the faith overheard her playing with them and singing songs to them. They thought they were trying to learn a new language. The only other thing she ever said that piqued my curiosity was when she told me that she chose me. On to the next one. My grandmother passed away about 10 years ago. We were very close. And my whole life, she always told me that she would be my guardian angel after she died. My daughter's five, and when she was three, she had terrible night terrors and would have a hard time going to sleep. I would spend the evenings with her, comforting her to help her fall asleep, reading books and talking. One night, I asked her what she wanted to be when she grows up. She kept telling me that she used to be a grown-up. After prying and asking what she meant, she told me that when she was a grown-up, she used to be my grandma. She then told me a story about when I was young, I had an accident and was burned when helping her cook dinner. It's something that I never told my daughter, and it did actually happen. It completely creeped me out. She has never really mentioned anything else like that since. On to the next one. I was just coming home from Appleby. My two-year-old sister was talking, and out of nowhere, she said, I'm Sylvia. Sylvia is the name of my stillborn sister. I asked her what she said, and she repeated, I'm Sylvia. My mom asked, Who are you? She replied once again, Sylvia. She had never heard the name before and my sister Sylvia died six years ago. I fully believe that Sylvia was reincarnated as my little sister. On to the next one. I was about five and in primary school playing with clay. At the time, I vividly recall remembering myself sitting by a small rushing river Crouch next to lots of dark-skinned, chatting women in African-style dress. It was like I had been transported there, and I was seeing the scene through my eyes. 
the women were washing colorful garments in the river. I remember how bright they looked in the splashing of the cloth in the water. I could feel that it was really hot, but where we were was green and shady. I was the same age in this memory, and I could see my hands moving in front of me. They looked exactly the same, but my skin was very dark, and I have white skin. It was my job to make lots of pots, and I recalled how I would mold them quickly and expertly with my hands. Back in the real world, I felt my hands automatically move. I quickly made lots of pots of different shapes and sizes out of the clay. This was without any prompting or suggestion at all. I remember feeling like I knew exactly what I was doing. I know that I'd never made them before, and it wouldn't have been something I'd learned off the TV at such a young age. We had never been abroad or anywhere like that place in my memory. I'll never forget my teacher coming over, her mouth agape and blurting out, Jesus Christ, those are incredible. On to the next one. I'm 24 years old, and I've never been on a train in my life. I've been on roller coasters, but not an actual train. No way. From being very young, my grandma and mom would take me to Six Flags in St. Louis in the summer. I was never scared of roller coasters. I was always the one leading whoever was with me down the long path up to the ride, coaster after coaster. I always knew that usually... About halfway through our visit, I'd be too chicken for a certain ride, and still am to this day. It was a train that takes you around the park. I'm afraid of the choo-choo train, and cannot for the life of me think of a single reason or even a possibility as to why the heck I'm so terrified of trains. I live in a small town in southeast Missouri, and my mom lives in the house right next door. Every so often, I would go next door and watch TV with her and my baby sister. A few years ago, I went around, and my mom came in from the kitchen with a plate of taco salad she just whipped up for us. My sister was playing in the corner. She sits down, and there was a show on the TV called Something Along the Lines of I Used to Be Alive. About 15 minutes into watching a show, my mom says, this reminds me of what you told me when you were about three. Thinking she was talking to my sister, I turned my head from the TV she was looking at. Puzzled, I said, huh? She then went on to tell me that when I was three years old, I randomly started talking about my other family. Apparently, from what she told me, I had said that me, my two sisters, my mom, and her cat were heading somewhere and we were all killed after our train crashed. At first, I laughed and thought she was joking with me. She swore to God that I told her that when I was young. In the moment, I realized it actually made sense. I've never in my life been able to find a reason for my fear of trains. On to the next one. When my youngest daughter was three years old, she would very often get upset. She would insist that I help her find her kids because they needed her. She would say that she was in a car accident and died, but her two children in the back seat survived and that they needed her. For almost two years, she had an overwhelming urge to find her kids and let them know that their mommy was okay. By the age of five, she had forgotten everything and never mentioned the kids or the car accident again. On to the next one. At Poplar River in Manitoba, many First Nation often saw a seven to eight foot tall Bigfoot with broad shoulders. The creature left three toed tracks that were 16 inches long by 5 inches wide. The creature was covered with gray fur, with white fur on top of the head, and it had the unusual habit of looking into people's windows and doors. On to the next one. A member of a farm family saw 
what they said was an 11 foot hairy creature outside and found 18 inch long footprints the following morning. This was in Steinbach in Manitoba in Canada. On to the next one. Near St. Ambrose in Manitoba. It was my ninth birthday. I had my cousins and my aunt and uncle were over to celebrate my birthday. My parents had gotten me a new bike that year. I had let my cousin ride my bike when the pedal kept falling off and he had left my bike on the outside of the fence. My dad told me, you better go get your bike before someone runs it over or takes it. So I go outside to get my bike. I was knelt down to fix my pedal when my aunt was screaming at me to go to her or to run into the house. My grandmother was standing in front of her screen door and was also very upset and screaming. I then stood up and looked at what my aunt was pointing at. It was a hairy thing. It was slim with its arms past its knees and it turned to look at me. It was quiet and there was no smell. It was a light brownish gray. It was no threat to me, but I looked at my aunt and she was still screaming. I dropped my pedal and ran into the house and told my dad and my uncle what I had seen. My dad and my uncle ran outside to go investigate what I had seen. They were footprints. My uncle kept a cast of one, but it is now gone. I don't know whatever happened to it. I think he gave it away to someone in the state. I know what I saw was real. I remember it like it was yesterday. There were three witnesses. My aunt was screaming at me to go into the house or to go to her. And my grandma was also screaming at her screen door, which was about a hundred feet away. I haven't heard of anyone ever seeing anything, but reports of a woman screaming was heard and never any explanation of the scream. It was 8.30 in the evening. It was still light out. It was a very nice evening. There were only dirt roads at the time in a very brushy area. It was going towards what I assume was the marsh or the beach area. On to the next one. Don Cunningham, a constable with the Dakota Jibwe Tribal Council, thought that he saw a deer on the side of the road as he drove his wife and children to Winnipeg in Manitoba in Canada. This deer then stood up on its hind legs. It was man-sized and covered with brown fur and with a white head and a light gray beard. Cunningham chased the creature which ran like a monkey. Later, he found footprints that were 16 inches long and looked like human hands. On to the next one. In Nopinning Provincial Park in Manitoba, the canoe trip starting point is at the river bridge. We canoed downstream for about eight to ten hours. There were a few portages and light rapids to run. I believe the lake we camped at is called Little Black Lake. The nearest town was probably Bissett, Manitoba. I can't say exactly if I had an encounter with a Bigfoot or not, but after reading several Bigfoot accounts, I have found some similarities with other encounters. I was on a three-day canoeing trip with a friend just east of Nopeming Provincial Park in eastern Manitoba, canoeing west from Highway 315 on the Black River. While canoe trips on this river are relatively popular, it is a rather remote area with marshland, coniferous forest, and lots of exposed rocks and cliffs, and many small lakes and streams. After a full day of canoeing, we arrived at a small lake. I believe it is called Little Black Lake. There is one good-sized island on the lake, which is close to the east shore, probably about 50 meters. And this is where we decided to camp. In the early evening, not long before sunset, we began to prepare our dinner. 
It was an extremely calm, pleasant evening. It was clear, warm, and there was virtually no wind. As I began to prepare our meal, I thought I could hear a faint noise in the far distance. At first, it could hardly be heard at all, and I didn't say anything to my companion as I just thought my ears were playing tricks on me. To me, however, it sounded like a baby crying. We encountered nor saw any evidence that anyone else was canoeing in the area, even upon a return trip. Gradually, the sound became louder and closer, and I finally asked my friend if he had been hearing anything. He replied that he thought he had been hearing something for about the last 15 minutes, but didn't say anything because he thought his ears might be playing tricks on him. After about 20 minutes, we could both clearly hear this noise, though now it sounded more like a high-pitched growling or whining. By this time, the sun had set and the conditions were twilight. After a few more minutes, we could hear twigs snapping and branches breaking, and the growling was very prominent, though it didn't sound anything like any animal growling I've ever heard. I suggested that it might be a wounded animal, perhaps a lynx, but I didn't think a lynx would make so much noise breaking branches. Eventually, this creature was directly across from us on the east shore of the lake and was pacing back and forth. It was very easy to follow the sound. By now, it was quite dark, and we could follow the sound back and forth with our flashlights. And at times, we thought we could see trees swing, as if being knocked, but we never saw the creature. After some time, we started to become quite worried, and I decided I would attempt to scare off the animal with a shot from the twenty-two rifle I had with me. I fired one shot into the tree top, above where the sound was coming from. There was a loud echo from the blast, and you could hear the bullet whiz through the air, and hear some branches break. Immediately, and for the first time since the beginning of this ordeal, the creature went silent, and then, a moment later, we could clearly hear it run off through the forest, snapping many twigs and breaking branches. We had several wildlife encounters on this trip. Moose, bear, deer, geese, but experienced nothing like that night. I've spent many years canoeing, hiking, and horseback riding in the wilderness, but to this day cannot account for what this might have been. I never heard sounds like it made before this time or since, and I've had many wild animal encounters. There was one other witness. We were both preparing dinner when the incident began. I've heard of other Bigfoot sightings and Bigfoot prints in this area. The encounter was just before, during, and after sunset, a total duration of about 30 minutes. On to the next one. Every year, Eddie and I plan a week of fall hunting in Washington's rainforest. Our target for this year's hunt was Roosevelt elk. The elk live in the thick, dense underbrush and forest, and the coastal mountain range of Washington State is one of the only locations in the world where they can be found. This region of the United States receives well over 100 inches of rainfall annually, and because of this, the underbrush is extremely lush. Now, any hunter will tell you that this thick underbrush brings with it advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that it can provide plenty of cover for the hunter, as well as being an ideal habitat for the animal. The disadvantages are the constant rain and dampness, as well as the extremely limited visibility for taking a quality shot at your prey. Most rifle shots will be taken at a range of 50 yards or less, 
and your typical bow shot is between 20 and 30 yards. I once took a bow shot at 5 yards in there. That's how close you can get to the animals in the forest. Because of the diverse weather and habitat challenges in this region, Roosevelt elk are one of the most difficult species to hunt. It is because of this difficulty that time spent on the hunt has a direct correlation to your success rate. Eddie and I keep a detailed hunting log on each of our trips. By doing so, we can fine-tune our techniques to help ensure that we have successful hunts in the future. We have found that when we plan hunts for 10 to 12 days, we have a 100% success rate, whereas a five-day hunt only yields between, say, 60 and 80% success. Our typical hunt consists of both bow and rifle hunting. We start with bow, since it's our preferred method. But if we find ourselves running out of time, the rifle becomes our weapon of choice. There are so many times when the animal is so close to us in the undergrowth and yet still too far away to land an effective bow shot. However, the rifle can be effective on day one for a well-schooled hunter. If you're going to have success with the bow, all of your ducks must be in order, and that starts with technique and location. Our most successful methodology to date is hunting either within the confines of a well-timbered canyon or near any river drainage areas that you can find. We also construct blinds in well-traveled areas and use calls to attract bulls, getting real aggressive with them when they start to get in tight to our position. Generally, the two of us like to situate ourselves closely to each other whenever possible, with the slope of a canyon being our preferred haunt. From that position, we have had the greatest success in sighting moving animals, both above and below us. An elk can surprise you by moving right across your path while you're stalking and be taken down with a quick shot. Whenever possible, we will also bring our quad with us in the truck. We want to get as close as possible to the target area before the hiking begins. It's also a great help in transporting the meat back with us when we get lucky. For this particular hunt, we had planned for four days. Even though this is on the lowest end of the success window, we knew the area extremely well and our confidence level was very high. Having experienced good success here in the past, we felt that we would score again. After setting up our tent by the truck, we took the quad into the forest and began our day's hunt. It's a rough hike into this terrain, but the two of us work out during the year to prepare for such excursions. The area that we were headed into was a steeply sloped canyon that had a very well-used trail running up and down within it. The trick in here was to position yourself in the best possible way to get off a quality bow shot. Too many times an elk is just out of effective range or slips behind some cover right as you are ready to let go. That, my friend, is the struggle of hunting. Day one came and went without seeing any Roosevelt. On day two, we headed directly back into the same location since we were satisfied with the overall animal population that we had seen the day before. We had better luck from the get-go. We saw a giant 5x5 five five Roosevelt bull walk by us at about 50 yards. We waited for him to come closer, but we had no such luck. We also saw a 3x3 three three after him, but we passed, hoping to bag the larger, more mature bull. Typically, when hunting with a guide, they will always advise that you take what you can because you may not get another opportunity. 
This is the best course of action for most hunters, especially if you don't hunt that frequently. However, we hunt quite frequently and have an experience level higher than most of our peers. Because of this, we were determined to get the 5x5 five five, or perhaps something even better. The next day, we moved our makeshift blinds into a slightly lower position. If he passed by again, the bull should be marginally closer to us than he had been the day before. However, we still didn't know if he would even come back. So we positioned ourselves and began the wait. It was 11.17 in the morning when about 30 elk came running down the trail. I know the exact time because I had just looked down at my watch and you never see these animals running unless they've been frightened. We looked at each other through the opening in the brush between the two blinds. Just four minutes after the herd ran through, I heard the snap of a branch and my eyes rolled in the direction of the sound. I could see a tremendous black figure moving down the trail, passing behind an opening in some pine boughs I gave a small finger signal to Eddie, and a moment later, a gigantic Bigfoot appeared, walking through a break in the trees, where the herd had just ran by. Three steps later, he was once again concealed by the pines, before reappearing yet again. We watched him as he walked down the entire trail toward the base of the canyon, the creature coming in and out of our view numerous times before it completely left our sight. The two of us came out of our blinds, speechless. We first looked at each other and then looked down into the canyon where he had walked. We were unable to put any words together, and I was completely and totally dumbfounded by what had just transpired. I was in a complete and utter daze, being as close as I will ever come to a true state of shock. Feeling like my mind had short-circuited, I was momentarily shut off as a human being. I'm surprised I didn't mess my pants, and if it had come towards us, I'm not even sure if I could have pulled my rifle out and shot it. It almost felt like I was under some type of mind control as it came into view and passed by, as if all my abilities had been put on hold. It is very difficult to describe or put into words. I think it must have been about 15 or 20 minutes before we had regained full functionality. At that point, the forest had become completely still and there were no signs of life whatsoever. We walked over to the trail, and there were no indications of any prints, just wide, flattened areas of pine needles where it had walked. The ground was very hard and well-traveled, which made it impossible to make real prints. The two of us had heard all the talk of Bigfoot. We were living and hunting in places where many people claimed to have seen them. And yet, up to that point in time, we had seen nothing ourselves. When the fog in our minds had dissipated, we went back to the truck and recorded all of the details in a notebook. Our sighting had occurred at about 11.20 a.m. It was drizzling out, and we had our rain gear on in the blinds. We had seen the elk herd run by, followed by hearing the branch snapping. When it first came into view, the Bigfoot did not seem like it was chasing the elk. It was just traveling and had more than likely spooked the herd unintentionally. It must be seen as a predatory animal to them. Otherwise, they would not have run from it in such a fashion. Because of our position in the blinds, it was much higher than us. It didn't stop or turn to look in our direction. Rather, it seemed to be completely unaware of our presence. The two of us agreed that it had to be every bit of eight to ten feet tall, a tremendous monster of a beast. 
neither one of us could remember measuring it up to anything it had either passed by or through. It was like a mega monster from a comic book or something, reminding me of the way they depict the Hulk busting out of a shirt and flexing his muscles. When it was passing in front of us, we could see its dark, brownish-black hair. It hung off the body and looked kind of shaggy, not at all like a bear's coat, more like a long-haired dog breed. I distinctly remember the hands being about 20 inches long. They were massive, like an oversized baseball mitt. Its head and shoulders looked like one piece, and there was no visible neck. As it descended the slope, the upper torso was cut into a clear V-shape like that of a bodybuilder. And if I had to venture a guess as to its width, I would say that it spanned five feet or more across the shoulders. Another thing comes to mind. From the back view, of the muscles of its upper back were so enormous that its head was virtually concealed when you looked at it from the side. Its jawline clearly protruded forward from the rest of the face, whereas the nose appeared almost flush to the face. I only recall seeing skin on the face and fingers, but what skin that I did see looked to be an extremely dark gray color. Its face also seemed deeply wrinkled, almost like it had grooves in it instead of wrinkles. Even though we hadn't scored a kill, we left that day and headed back to Oregon. I think I speak for both of us when I say that we are different people today because of that event. We will never hunt or go into the woods with the same mindset that we had before. And seeing that Bigfoot had transformed both of our lives and our thinking. On to the next one. Most of the anecdotal stories received in regard to alien sightings have come from average people with average lives. Daryl Sims is a different story. He used to work for the very agency that many UFO conspiracy theorists have portrayed as part of the cover-up when it comes to aliens. Mr. Sims was once a special agent for the CIA, but Sims' information on UFOs and aliens comes not so much from his previous work with the CIA as from his own personal experience. You see, Mr. Sims claims that he himself is an abductee. According to Daryl Sims, his first encounter with aliens occurred when he was a small child. In 1952, his childhood home was situated in Midland, Texas. He had a bedroom located in the back of the house, but there were outside lights attached to a well house immediately behind this room. So Sims was always bathed in dim lighting, allowing him to see easily at night. It was under this dim lighting that he first perceived the alien entity that had mysteriously appeared in the middle of his room. He had spontaneously awoken to see a creature that was all white from head to toe. It was quite literally as white as snow. The being wasn't wearing any clothing, and its classical alien features of big head, big eyes, small nose, and just a slit for a mouth let him know immediately that this visitor was not human. According to Sims, he immediately felt the fact that he saw the creature with some sort of error or mistake on the being's part. The entity appeared just as shocked and surprised as he was when it saw Sims open his eyes and wake up. It was as if the entity was not prepared for this to happen and had expected him to remain asleep. After getting over its surprise, the being moved in to correct this glitch by looking directly into Sims' eyes and sending him a telepathic signal that instantly rendered him paralyzed. But although he couldn't move, Sims could still see, and he saw the entity still standing over his completely helpless body. He was now very frightened. 
Interestingly, if this episode is to be believed, it seems to present itself as the complete opposite of sleep paralysis. Many critics and detractors of alien abduction accounts, especially those that occur in the middle of the night, have claimed that these are simply particularly vivid dreams coupled with sudden awakening in the full throes of sleep paralysis. You see, the condition known as sleep paralysis happens to all of us, with the exception of some sleepwalkers. We all become temporarily paralyzed while we sleep. This happens as a safeguard to keep us from acting out our dreams. Critics of the alien abduction narrative have often attempted to explain instances of people waking up paralyzed and seeing odd figures at the end of their beds as nothing more than the ramifications of a sudden interruption of this bodily process. But in the case of Sims, he woke up fully able to move, and then the alien creature he observed did something to make him paralyzed. He didn't open up his eyes to find himself paralyzed, as is common with sleep paralysis. He woke up fully mobile and then was rendered completely immobile. The entity wasn't done either, as Sims stared in unblinking, utterly paralyzed horror. The creature actually pulled away the covers that was half covering his face, so much for hiding under the covers, and once again stared deeply into his eyes. As the alien looked, looked him in his eyes, something about his perception of the experience changed. The entity seemed to be directly changing Sim's perception of the events. And as the being stared right before his eyes, the creature seemed to change shape, shifting from the frightening alien to a comical and friendly clown. According to Sims, it was as if it had pulled the most cartoonish and upbeat image it could find right out of his own memory bank, and then superimposed that image onto itself, either to hide its identity or to lessen the fear that Daryl Sims was experiencing, or maybe a combination of both. At any rate, he was now staring directly at Bozo the Clown as he whimsically walked around his bedroom. This action would seem to be an example of an entity directly employing a screen memory in order to conceal what was really happening to the abductee. Sims claims that he has experienced odd instances such as this all throughout his life. Sims also maintains that, as a CIA agent, he dealt with and investigated many others who claimed to have experienced this kind of sleight-of-mind trick. Incredibly, Sims believes this is why so many people are afraid of creepy clowns, because they have experienced an event such as he did, where some overachieving alien attempted to pull the wool over their eyes by employing a screen memory. Even more telling, in the case of Sims, the next morning, he was at the breakfast table with the fragments of his strange dream about the clown, already becoming foggy, when he noticed a mark on his body of a type that alien abduction researchers commonly refer to as scoop marks. In one of the greatest pieces of anecdotal evidence for the phenomenon, alleged alien abductees from all around the world seem to have these places on their skin where a chunk of flesh has been scooped out. It literally looks like as if someone took a small spoon and scooped out a sample of the tissue, just like you or I would sample some ice cream. Incredibly, as Sims stared down at the strange mark, that wasn't there before, he distinctly heard a voice in his head remark. You fell and hurt yourself. It was as if some outside force was programming an excuse in his mind as to where the scoop mark had come from. Later in his life, after his own alien encounters had long ceased, he claims his last visitation was when he was 17 and they haven't returned since. Sims claims to have learned how to use the alien's techniques in hypnotic mind control and subterfuge against them. 
Incredibly, he claimed that he has managed to cause disruption among the ETs themselves by tampering with the minds of their own abductee victims. A female abductee he met in 1991 volunteered to be his test subject for the psychological warfare he wished to wage against the ETs. Sim, knowing full well that aliens routinely scan the minds of their subjects, a monkey wrench in their system, by implanting an artificial memory that they would have no way to account for. He therefore used the power of hypnotic suggestion to implant a completely false memory and buried it in her subconscious. This woman would not be able to consciously recall or access the memory herself, but the ETs would pick it up during one of their routine mind scans and have no idea where it came from. Sims claims that he also gave the woman a post-hypnotic suggestion that would cause her to wake up out of the alien inducted trance as soon as the memory was accessed. According to the female abductee, the suggestion worked. She became fully awake in the middle of her ordeal and shouted at the aliens, Daryl knows what you are doing. According to this woman, the aliens seemed so perturbed that they couldn't account for what was happening, that they seemed to be on the verge of nervous breakdown. Sims contended that while this may seem like a minor incident, to be able to disrupt and manipulate the alien protocol, even in the slightest degree, was a big deal. They had never experienced interference like this before and didn't know what to make of it. Daryl Sims felt as if he had finally struck back at the entities in retaliation for all the years of stress they had caused him as a young man. He had given them some stress of their own to deal with. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!